the next two, two lectures will be more in consideration of prolegomena to any direct engagement or uh, doing, <clears throat> excuse me, of dogmatic theology. Um, so in this sense, the next two lectures will be uh, a bit more abstract in outline form, a bit skeletal. Um, and in that sense, because of the abstractness of these next two lectures, um, there will be a bit more difficulty, um, perhaps at the outset, in understanding exactly how these apply. Um, but they are absolutely essential in terms of understanding the nature of dogma, the nature of theology, and the manner in which philosophical concepts are situated, uh, perhaps appropriated and employed in the context of dogmatic theology. So in these next two lectures, we'll look at <clears throat> the prolegomena to uh, any development of and, and engagement with dogmatic Christology following uh, the Council of Chalcedon uh, in terms of uh, a general presentation or overview of the sources of dogmatic theology, uh, dogmatic theology's distinctiveness, and the development uh, in terms of a brief uh, review and overview of basically the formulation of how I understand um, dogmatic theology can be and should be pursued in terms of its a priori assumptions and considerations as well as the a posteriori use of sources and their organization uh, to the end of a uh, coming up with an understanding of the historical reality context and developments of the authoritative teaching of the church as well as how this engagement with theological questions theological topics and their development is already situated or rooted in the reality of the church, the reality of the church founded by Christ and um, its teaching as mediated through the appointed successors and teachers of Christ, as well as uh, further expounded and articulated in the context of the teaching and writings of the church fathers, um, the official documents, ecumenical conciliar documents, of the church and um, looking towards uh, the role of dogmatic theology's place in building up the church itself in terms of its own um, inner life and perfection as a manifestation and participation of the energies of the Holy Spirit building up the church in love and creating uh, a greater participation and fulfillment of the purpose of theology as such, which is so that we may become good, so that we may love God better and love our neighbors better because we know better what God has actually revealed in Christ. So then the first point to look at is we must first have an idea of what dogma is in the life of the church as well as the manner in which we engage in the dogmatic teachings of the church in terms of theology. So um, we will first have to distinguish what is dogma and then what is theology and then how dogmatic theology is uh, distinguished from yet related to and not separated from other modes of theology such as uh, a more pure speculative theology or systematic theology as well as spiritual and mystical forms of theology and other methods of theology such as, or approaches to theology such as positive theology as distinct from speculative theology and um, how we can understand how these things are, these different modes of theology are integrated and what they presume and in a sense how dogmatic theology um, represents a certain high point in uh, the theological endeavor and um, in a sense provides a the guiding light or direction to the other modes of theology. So the first question that will have to be dealt with is what is dogma and what is theology? How do they come together? And that will lead us to the second question on this slide. Uh, what is dogmatic theology? What are its assumptions? What are its methods? Um, what are its sources? 
And this will lead us to a recognition that there are certain a priori conditions and uh, suppositions or assumptions for dogmatic theology in order for the project to even begin. Um, but we'll also find then that in actually carrying out or engaging in dogmatic theology, there's the element or we will, we will proceed through uh, a posteriori methods, meaning there will have to be a given, which is a priori, or a set of givens, which are a priori to the very project of dogmatic theology. But in terms of engaging, analyzing, systematizing um, in a dogmatic theological way, uh, we'll have to also make use of a posteriori methods such as research um, in terms of the sources, analysis in terms of understanding what is being posited by the teaching authority of the church and its authentic sources or witnesses, and then how do we form a synthesis moving forward uh, in the project of dogmatic theology. The next question is, um, is dogmatic theology different from other forms of theology? Well, some people, you know, individuals, theologians will come down on different, um, in different places on this question um, for the purposes of our course and how uh, I conceive of dogmatic theology. I will say there, there is a difference between dogmatic theology and the other forms of theology, even though uh, there's a natural outworking, for example, of dogmatic theology in terms of systematics that will help organize and synthesize what is the dogmatic teaching of the church, what is the dogmatic theological presentation of the teaching of the church on the one hand. Um, so in this sense, dogma and dogmatic theology can't be absolutely or radically separated from systematic theology, but we can indicate that systematic theology can and often does have ends and purposes that don't coincide or, or perhaps extend beyond uh, the systematic organization and representation of what the dogmatic teachings of the church are in terms of a theological synthesis. So systematic theology can both begin and end in places other than dogmatic theology because it will include certain questions, be motivated by certain questions, um, and have certain outcomes and intentions that don't exactly coincide with what I'm imagining or conceiving of as dogmatic theology. Uh, the same holds true for spiritual or mystical theology insofar as dogmatic theology's purpose is a theological representation or systemati systematization of the dogmatic teachings of the church, while spiritual or mystical theology has more in terms of its direct purpose or telos, um, the understanding of how dogmatic theology ramifies and is integrated into the actual and practical spiritual life of individuals in the church, as well as how um, the spirituality embedded in or implied by dogmatic theology uh, ramifies and affects the life, both the teaching life, but especially the sacramental and spiritual life of the church as a whole in its development. Um, towards that ever greater conformity to the purpose of God for creating, uh, for becoming incarnate, and for establishing his church with the end of uh, perfect union and charity of all believers and ultimately all mankind or all humankind in the love life of the Trinity. And so in this respect, then, we will be outlining a certain approach to dogmatic theology um, indicating negative aspects in terms of limitations of the manners in which dogmatic theology can be approached, and limitations also in terms of what can and can't be said in accordance to valid principles of dogmatic theology that flow directly from uh, the dogma of the church. Um, so this will in entail both the consideration of epistemic and historical limitations placed upon a theologian in pro statu isto, that is, in the life of the believer, the believing theologian as such, within the context of the historical situation or context of that believer pursuing theology. And at the same, while at the same time, on the other hand, uh, we will outline positive aspects and outcomes of theology, which I've already hinted at in terms of 
a clearer articulation and deepening of our understanding of what both is taught dogmatically by the church as well as the implications of what is taught in terms of uh, the dealing with uh, heresy, uh, the exclusion of heresy, which on the one hand is a certain kind of negation or ruling out of certain positions, while on the other hand it implies a need for further clarification and deepening of those same dogmatic teachings under dispute. So let's begin by clearing the ground. What is particular about dogma? What we want here to do is get at a clearer understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about dogma. Um, here, we need to distinguish between, on the one hand, dogma and theology, and on the other hand, the composite term dogmatic theology that is the purpose of our course. So we need to distinguish really three things. One is, what is dogma? We need to identify dogma in terms of the life of the church and the life of the believing theologian, as distinct from theology, because theology admits of multiple modes of, of, of pursuit, as well as um, distinct ends, distinct insofar as they are different, formally speaking, um, while yet integrated and um, interconnected in terms of their real purpose and reality. So let's first get a bit of a clear understanding of what dogma is. And if this is a bit of review for some of you, uh, hopefully it will be useful um, for those who haven't had this um, kind of presentation or haven't encountered uh, a presentation that makes these distinctions. Um, this is also very important for you because it's absolutely essential um, to understand what we're engaging in when we get to the topics of post-Chalcedon Christology proper. So let's begin with a couple of negations. We first have to, to come to a determination of what dogma is not. Well, dogma is not equivalent to preaching. Preaching has to do with the positive proclamation of dogma but it is distinct from dogma insofar as dogma concerns the actual content of the teaching of the revelation of Christ and its ramifications while preaching has to do with the communication in a certain uh, rhetorical mode, aiming for the enlightenment of the minds of believers as well as the, the conversion of their souls, uh, practically spe speaking. So dogma, in a sense, is linked to the voice of the church insofar as the church preaches, but dogma is not reducible to preaching because preaching can have different ends than the uh, formal content or exposition of the formal content of preaching. And um, therefore, there, there needs to be some sort of initial distinction. Uh, St. Basil writes that dogma and proclamation are two distinct things. Doctrine we profess without argument. So. So in this instance, dogma is equivalent to doctrine, and doctrine has to do with teaching. Doctrine is what is assumed by the believer as posited on the authority of God himself through Christ, who is the incarnate word of God, the second person of the Trinity in the flesh. Um, and we accept his teaching without argument because it's rooted in divine authority. Um, <clears throat> the the, the aspect of preaching or kerygma has to do with the proclamation of our teaching. And this can take on many different modes and certainly is not as all encompassing or necessarily systematic or integrative um, as the project of understanding dogma, the reception of dogma and the interpretation of dogma in a properly theological mode. Secondly, dogma does not equal apologetics. Um, in this respect, um, in a sense then, dogma, unlike apologetics, is intra-ecclesial, meaning it's directed towards the believers within the church, whereas apologetics has more to do with giving a reason of uh, defense or explanation or account of why 
the dogma is credible to be, to, uh, be believed um, and how it should be understood that doesn't create the impression of absurdity uh, towards those who are not already believers. So dogma is oriented or disposed towards believers as such, while apologetics is um, intended to give a defense to non-believers for why Christians believe what they believe. So dogma has again to do with the content of revelation, its meaning, implication, and application, while apologetics has to do with um, <clears throat> the the uh, correlated but not identical nor essential component of the Christian life of giving a reasoned account to those who don't already believe. Um, referring to dogma, we can just briefly quote St. Gregory of Nyssa when he writes, let us reason within our own borders. Um, this is the fundamental principle of dogmatic theology. Um, dogmatic theology reasons upon, seeks greater understanding and clarity and articulation of what is already believed on the basis of divine authority. While apologetics is not um, assuming uh, the truth or the divine authority for sake of argument, um, but rather it's defending the reasonability, the rationality, the credibility of those who already believe uh, what has been divinely revealed on uh, Christ's own authority. Now that we've stated a couple of negative or stipulated what dogma is not, uh, it's important and helpful to have a better idea of what dogma is. So what we need is a positive definition of dogma. Um, as has already been mentioned uh, by uh, quoted the quote, quotations of St. Basil and uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa, we say that dogma is for the believing community of the faithful. Um, this is what the faithful believe in terms of the virtue of faith in its most proper sense and what the the faithful intend to integrate in terms of dogma's ramifications for practical life and the ordering of the church's uh, communal way of life uh, it may be you could one could say that dogma is the life of the church translated or transposed into teaching with intellectual content it's based upon authoritative, authoritative teaching, namely divine authority, divine authority stemming from Christ himself as sent by the Father, and in terms of Christ's own sending of the Spirit to guide the church, especially through the teaching apostles and their successors into all truth. So dogma is authoritative teaching that must be believed on that divine authority. And practically speaking, dogma is realized and in a sense already, in a very real sense, already presupposes the reality of the church, the sacramental economy established or founded by Christ and pre-existing the believer, um, especially through its sacramental economy. And thus what would follow from this is, is if dogma is oriented or directed to the inner life of the church, and it's founded upon and realized, practically speaking, in the sacramental life of believers within the sacramental communion and economy of the church, dogmatic theology is properly pursued by believing theologians, meaning theologians who are members of the church already with the gift of faith, possessing the gift of faith and operating um, through their intellective and effective powers or energies in terms of this divine faith. Uh, a bit of a qualification here is perhaps in order. Um, it is possible for non-believers to pursue theology in a very systematic way and even deal with items of belief or theological assertions or axioms that depend essentially upon the authority of revelation and are formally um, not able to be inferred or derived from uh, reflection on, on reality apart from the virtue of faith. And thus there can be a certain kind of systematic theology and even a, a kind of natural faith of unbelieving theologians based upon uh, natural criteria or natural motives of credibility. But yet this is not properly dogmatic theology or perhaps better, not dogmatic theology in the most proper sense, because 
such people, uh, it can't be said, are fully uh, integrated into the life of the church, nor do they approach or receive uh, the church's teaching as having divine authority, but rather as having some sort of derivative um, historical, communal, or human authority. So um, the, the, the upshot is, is dogmatic theology is properly pursued by believing theologians because believing theologians operate according to the principle of divine faith rather than according to the principle of some form of human faith that doesn't um, place the or doesn't see the motive for assenting to the church that, or the, the dogmatic teachings of the church in terms of divine authority, but rather some other lesser motive of credibility. Adding on to uh, the comments I just made, um, the question of what is dogma can be further articulated in terms of the fundamental uh, historicity of the life of the church and thus the life of the church's worship and um, teaching and expression of faith. Um, be because the incarnation both presupposes and essentially includes this dual natured, dual energied mode of existence, one that is divine, one that is human, um, one that is eternal, one that is historical and founded upon and flowing out of the single divine person of the word, Jesus Christ, the incarnate Logos. Um, dogmatic theology will necessarily take on expressions and modes of inquiry and even reasoning in terms of theoretical analysis that is um, implicated in the historical, um, meaning that the historical cannot be absolutely prescinded from because the manifestation of dogmatic the uh, the theology or dogmas of the church while being immutable and absolute in themselves based upon the authority of Christ, nevertheless are still communicated and um, reflected upon and applied and developed in a historical context. So we're dealing with the, the bipolarity, the dual nature, the diophysite um, reality of Christian teaching, um, the historical yet transcendent life of the church, especially her worship. And because the life of the church, its teaching and worship is realized and worked out in history, although we're rooted in the eternal person of the word and the eternal will of the father. Um, there nevertheless it will be historical development in terms of the church's own deepening of and presentation of uh, the revealed dogmas of the faith. So we can expect that there will be a certain, or perhaps even better, we will we can posit that there will be historical developments in the life of the church's articulation and clarification of its own dogmatic teachings as received initially from Christ and through his apostles. So there will be historical development just simply because historical development is a condition that is essentially human at least in this economy of salvation. A second key aspect though, is that because there is a unity in the teacher and the teacher himself is an eternal person, the eternal word of the father, and the father sends the spirit to manifest um, the son in a, a, a temporal sacramental ecclesial uh, context, there will not just be development, but more importantly, this development will contain uh, essential notes of continuity, such that um, the church fathers and approved theologians will validly uh, denounce any notion and renounce any notion of novelty in their teaching in terms of the developed articulation of orthodox dogma and thus dogmatic theology against uh, heretics of all sorts. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, there will be um, a certain real development, but this development is based upon the supposition of the unity and integrity of the initial revelation 
that maintains um, an identity through time. So developments are not, in a sense, strict new additions or e evolutions from one thing to another, but rather a further outworking and um, application of the essential core or the implications already built into um, the initial dogmatic teaching of the church. So thus, while there's historical development, there is an essential continuity. And from a philosophical standpoint, um, development seems to presuppose continuity because uh, something, one thing cannot develop without some sort of principle of unity and stability through this development, unless you simply admit that a development is a kind of essential change. And this is something that is anathema to the mind of the fathers and um, needs to be wrestled with. We have to see developments in terms of continuity, not in terms of discontinuity. And thus then, uh, in dealing with dogma and working out the criteria and method and contents of a dogmatic theology, especially a dogmatic Christology, we will have to uh, develop and employ a theological hermeneutic. And thankfully, that hermeneutic in its principles and its basic outlines um, have already been offered by church, the church's approved teachers and doctors uh, in the past. And so we have um, already a good deal of basis established for working out uh, such a theological hermeneutic that is supplied in and through the church itself by her approved teachers. So if dogma is the revealed teaching of Jesus Christ and believed on his authority as the voice of the Father, the one who manifests the Father, the one who declares the Father, and thus is worthy of belief on that divine authority, what can we say then about theology? Because uh, our target here is dogmatic theology. It's neither dogma alone, which is the common uh, heritage and inheritance of all believers who have faith, um, nor is it theology alone, because theology admits of many modes, um, all the way from natural theology and apologetics to um, various forms of systematic theology and non-Christian theology. So what, what is theology in terms of our target for formulating uh, a better notion of what is dogmatic theology or how theology relates to dogma? Simply stated, theology is a word about God, uh, theos logos. Um, better put, theology is the study of God. So <clears throat> God is the proper subject of theology. And if that's the case, then there must be a God. And so in this sense, a presupposition of dogmatic theology is that God exists and that he is sufficiently revealed or manifested himself such that there can be human words about God and thus an ordered course of inquiry or study or even better science about God. And this is what theology is. And uh, we'll say a little bit more about the various types of theology as we move along in this lecture. The types of theology can, although uh, there is some dispute, um, there are different ways of categorizing the various modes or types of theology. In brief, theology proper falls under two subheadings, positive theology and dogmatic theology. Positive theology has to do with the interaction of evidences that interface or terminate or are dispositive of the believer in terms of motives of credibility, meaning reasons to believe that revelation has occurred and is true. And there is a rationality for believing that this revelation has a certain divine authority that should be assented to, or rather the theology or the dogmas should be assented to on the basis of that divine authority itself. And dogmatic theology, as we've already uh, begun to uh, articulate, is rather motivated in terms of the assent of faith to the teachings of Christ and his apostles through the church on the basis of the intrinsic 
divine authority as such. So dogmatic theology already presupposes that the believer has faith and that this faith is credible even on natural bases. And there are certain evidences that motivate or uh, justify um, to the theologian himself, the believing theologian him or herself, or and even as well to unbelievers that the um, enterprise or undertaking of dogmatic theology is not just simply irrational. However, the mode of inquiry and the mode of procedure of dogmatic theology is, like as I mentioned earlier, intra-ecclesial and already based upon an acceptance of the truths of revelation as such on the basis of divine authority. A brief rundown of positive theology now. Um, in one sense, <clears throat> while uh, dogmatic theology is um, faith-seeking understanding, we might say positive theology is understanding-seeking faith. And by this, is I, I simply intend to um, convey that theology's, positive theology's mode of procedure is based upon the an intellectual analysis of the credibility of faith itself. It's not rooted, um, formally speaking, as a discipline in faith, although clearly faithful believers and faithful theologians will have faith. Um, the mode of procedure isn't justified on that faith as such. Rather, it's it's seeking to understand the sources and the development of what is believed by divine faith in terms of evidentiary criteria that don't uh, coextend and don't formally imply or include divine faith. And the, the most basic sense of positive theology here is what's called fundamental theology. And fundamental theology really just simply means what the term says. Fundamental has to do with the foundations of theology proper in terms of sources, uh, collation or organization, and of the data of revelation without necessarily presupposing the revelation is true, just rather what is revelation, what are its material contents, and how are they organized. And in some sense then fundamental theology is derived from the various sources of theology, and we will touch upon this later, and this is important because um, dogmatic theology specifies most clearly the mode or the assumptions of pursuing theology rather than the material contents. So in a sense, dogmatic theology shares or overlaps po with positive theology in terms of the material sources, in terms of the contents, but it has a, a different mode of procedure. One, uh, namely positive theology, is the understanding seeking or the intellect seeking a better understanding and justification for the rationality and credibility of, as, of faith as such, while dogmatic theology is based upon already the presumption of faith and seeking through that principle to organize and explicate the material of and the data of revelation. And so the um, fundamental theology is derived from the sources of theology, the locis theologicis, would, theologicis excuse me, which I will deal with a little bit uh, later in this lecture in terms of Melchior, Melchior Cano's uh, the, seven, the 16th century theologians, great work on that topic. And finally then, um, if fundamental theology has to do with the gathering and organization of the data, the material data of revelation, it also tries to establish what the content of that revelation is insofar far as that content has certain limiting factors, barriers. So um, for example, we will, in positive theology, um, seek to understand well what is scripture what are its contents what are its boundaries what are its limitations such that we know what to include and what to exclude on the basis of the historical witness of the church with regard to its own contents in terms of what the church has established and recognized as being included in revelation and then how the theologians can then use that revelation Another aspect of fundamental theology is apologetics. Um, fundamental theology is uh, directed more towards 
theology proper in terms of identifying the sources and contents of revelation, while apologetics is oriented towards um, identifying the the marks of credibility to non-believers. Um, and so in, in that sense, apologetics has a more limited scope and uh, limited focus and purpose because it's giving a reasoned account of the reasonability of faith rather than trying to collate and organizing and organize just what is the contents of revelation and what is the contents or are the contents of revelation and thus faith. So now that we've discussed kind of the, the bare bones basics of fundamental theology, or rather positive theology as distinct from a dogmatic theology, we now turn more to the direct or directly to the more pertinent question of what is dogmatic theology? What is dogmatics? And here we have to distinguish between a prioris of dogmatic theology or dogmatics and a posterioris of dogmatics, namely what we must assume or presume in order to do dogmatics versus how dogmatics is actually pursued in terms of the content of revelation. Naturally, there will be a formal principle to dogmatic theology as well as a material principle, namely, well, what does the dogmatic theologian deal with? Not necessarily how he deals with it. So the a priori designates how the dogmatic theologian deals with the contents of revelation, while the a posteriores we will find um, are guided by the a prioris of dogma, but yet employ necessarily so um, certain a posteriori conditions through which the dogmatic theologian operates. So in the first place, like any other science or discipline, uh, the dogmatic theology must assume that its subject exists, namely that there is dogma. And by implication then, if there's dogma, there's an incarnation, and the incarnation is of a divine person sent by a father and who sends the Holy Spirit, and thus a trinity. So we must assume then that the subject of dogma really exists. And this is where positive theology helps because it helps establish that, yes, the subject, namely dogma, and all of its own presuppositions really are existent and really are something that can be studied. Um, so in, 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 in essence, no scientist proves the existence or reality of his or her subject of inquiry. For example, the uh, geometer would not um, try to prove qua uh, uh, geometrician um, that arithmetic exists and is, and is valid. No, this, the, the, the geometer presupposes the reality of arithmetic and thereby number and math. Um, and in so far as this is a condition for uh, further sciences, so also the dogmatic theologian must presuppose the, the reality of God, the reality of the incarnation, the church, its sacramental theology, and ultimately and primarily the reality of the church's dogma, the dogma that has been revealed in time. And the next question is then, what is dogmatic theology's scope and purpose? Well, dogmatic theology is a composite term that includes dogma and specifically the mode of inquiry or theological inquiry rooted in and flowing out and based upon dogma. So the scope of dogmatic theology then is the articulation and clarification and presentation in a systematic way what the church authoritatively teaches must be believed on divine authority. And embedded in that scope, we find the purpose. The purpose is a clarification and presentation of the church's divinely revealed teaching for the sake of the salvation of sinners, first with respect to those in the church, but also with respect to shaping and guiding the church's missionary mandate and apologetical mandates. The next question is then, and this pertains to how the a priori of dogmatic theology ramifies into an engagement and 
uh, appropriation or better assimilation and use of uh, authorities because dogmatic theology is based upon authority and dogmatic theology is the um, operation of faith seeking understanding then when we're speaking of a revealed truth that revealed truth already implies that it's not something that we can acquire or get or achieve on our own. Rather, it must be delivered to us in some manner intelligible and universal by a commissioned authority. And so because the life of the church is founded in Christ, but yet sees its teaching um, presented and articulated through uh, the course of history in many contexts, and in terms of various questions and assumptions, um, we have to then deal with, well, who is an authority? What are the authorities for the dogmatic theologian? And then how does that dogmatic theologian um, interact or use those authorities and sources? Um, <clears throat> then the question naturally arises, which we've already touched upon, is how do we develop a theological hermeneutic or method for an interaction with these various sources and authorities in light of um, real historical doctrinal developments, as well as in changing historical and cultural contexts. And this is where the, the, the issue of magisterium uh, comes up. And magisterium basically has to do with a twofold uh, teaching uh, office. One has to do with um, those things that pertain to piety, um, uh, and uh, worship and things to be respected. And those um, are especially uh, have to do with liturgical and um, practical norms and teachings of the churches of the church that don't directly relate to or are not formally included in something positively revealed um, by Christ um, to his apostles on the one hand. And this is a lesser source of, a magister of magisterium, but it still is a valid teaching office of the church and how the church uses its own sources of theology and authorities in theology and so there in this second or derivative understanding of magisterium flows from a prior understanding of merit of magisterium which is directly and most important directly pertinent and most important for the project of dogmatic theology and that has to do with magisterium in terms of what is to be believed and this is what we will look at. So what is essential to get is that dogmatic theology or dogmatics presupposes the reality of its subject, the integrity of its presentation, as well as development of its presentation through an authoritative magisterium that has the capacity and office to finally determine what is included or what is to be excluded from dogma and thus dogmatic theology in terms of its own sources and methodology. So to sum up, what makes dogmatic theology distinct is that it is rooted in faith and it's a faith-seeking understanding, a divine faith that assents to the teaching of Christ through his church on the basis of divine authority alone. So dogma is the revelation of Christ, the authoritative teaching of the church, and <clears throat> its formal mode of operation is through the virtue or the, the energy of divine faith rooted or based upon and having its formal note of motivation in the divine authority, the acceptance of the divine authority of the teaching posited by Christ through the church. And so dogmatic theology then, rooted in faith and rooted in the revelation of Christ, has for its own focus a certain advance in terms of a deepening and clarification of the existing teaching of the church. And this happens negatively in correction and exclusion of heresy, which often motivates or occasions uh, a further clarification or deepening and refinement of the church's positions. Um, the church's position or articulated position up to that point. And this is something that is ringingly clear in the history of the development of 
Trinitarian Christology, and as we will see in this course, um, uh, Christology proper. And um, so if that's a negative aspect of uh, the role of dogmatic theology and the dogmatic theolo theologian in terms of heresy, um, there also is a positive aspect that can occur in and often has, especially in the past, occurred in terms of the interaction and engagement with heretical um, developments or rather um, uh, distractions or departures from the dogmatic teaching of the church in terms of heresy, or also, as we will see in Newman later on, that this can happen in terms of in own, the, the uh, dogma's own intrinsic um, impetus or disposition for clear articulation, even in the absence of heresy. Um, and we see instances of those, especially in the uh, Marian teaching, uh, the Marian definitions of the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption. Uh, clearly, no heresy was directly involved in terms of those pronouncements, but there nevertheless was in terms of the objective contents of revelation, as well as in terms of the dogmatic teaching up to that point of the church, a certain inner logic and impetus that uh, was manifested more fully in the subsequent definitions. So uh, to sum up then, um, dogmatic theology has a certain positive aspect in terms of a clear articulation, regardless of the occasion, in terms of both uh, application and the implications of pre-existing authoritative or dogmatic teaching. So in this sense, then, built into the question of dogmatic theology and doing dogmatic theology, uh, one will have to wrestle with the issue of the development of doctrine um, and have a, properly, un, uh, have a properly formed approach to what a development is in terms of authentic doctrinal development versus uh, a certain departures that often take the name and per perhaps even appear to be authentic developments. So those are important aspects of what makes dogmatically dogmatic theology distinct from positive theology, and then really uh, how it functions in terms of the actual project of pursuing and engaging in dogmatic theology as such. So to sum up then, the a priori assumptions of dogmatic theology are A, that there is a real subject of inquiry located in the reality of the church and its teaching. Two, there are sources by which the believer accesses these teachings. And then three, there are certain rules and constraints built into doing dogmatic theology. One, we must first be believers and learners, receiving the magisterial teachings of Christ through the mediation of his appointed teachers. And then second, there are limits in terms of accessing this teacher, this teaching. The first being epistemic. Well, the teaching is revealed. We don't, we, we don't have direct access, nor can we ever have a direct comprehension of the essence of God. We only see the energies of God or the operations of God through his created manifestations, or at least insofar as his operations and energies manifest themselves to created persons in a created historical context. So there are epistemic limits. So we don't have direct access to the very axioms or rather principles of dogmatic theology. Rather, we accept the prim prim primary, primary or primordial teaching of dogmatic theology on the basis of what has been revealed by the divine teacher himself and then uh, preserved and developed through his church, which he established to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Um, <clears throat> the second aspect, directly correlated to, but in a sense derivative upon the epistemic limitations that dogmatic theologians must recognize and must accept, are historical limitations. We have only the historical witness, and the witness is oftentimes not comprehensive. In fact, it makes no sense in a certain way to ask the question of what would be a comprehensive or exhaustive historical witness. We have limited sources and we have limited access, both in terms of the content and in terms of uh, the, the drift or changes in human culture and society and even intellectual 
concepts, philosophical, theological concepts. So there is, uh, there are certain limitations that are of a strictly historical nature that must be wrestled with by the dogmatic theologian, always assuming there is a continuity of dogmatic faith and thus dogmatic theology that is accessible and is able at least to some extent, to some valid extent, be articulated by dogmatic theologians in an orderly way, according to an orderly hermeneutic of theology, while at the same time accepting that any structuring or presentation of dogmatic theology will also be subject to further clarification, rejection, or acceptance in part or in whole by uh, the authoritative magisterium. And so what though then these two epistemic and historical limitations entail is that we must develop on the basis of our assumptions of dogmatic theology and our assumption of the operation of divine faith and charity in the life of the dogmatic theologian, we must assume also, or this strictly implies better, um, an a posteriori method of pursuing dogmatic theology. So this is the second component. If there's an a priori um, set of conditions for doing dogmatic theology, there also are a posteriori conditions and methods for doing um, dogmatic theology. And this is really where a lot of the work of the dogmatic theologian takes place, is in operating and interacting with these a posteriori constraints and according to a posteriori methodology. So some basics on the dogmatic or the a posteriori of dogmatics, how we proceed. The first point to, to be noted is that dogmatic theology searches for unifying themes, traits, and other uh, common aspects <clears throat> in the teachings of the church that are sufficiently clear, meaning they're known, and public that can reach a wide consensus amongst theologians. Well, this is setting the bar rather high, um, but this is in a sense an ideal goal in terms of how we should proceed in doing dogmatic theology. And so if this is true, then it would imply that the formulation and use of methods, theological methods, that will be agreeable to, or at least re reach a wide consensus amongst believing theologians. Now here's the rub. So far, even amongst intra-Byzantine theologians, intra-Orthodox theologians, on the one hand, and intra-Latin theologians, uh, on the other hand, there have been no universal set of methods or criteria that have de facto achieved an absolute and universal consensus amongst dogmatic theologians. Now this might lead us to uh, briefly despair and say, well, why should we pursue the whole, uh, the whole uh, project in the first place? Well, I think the motivation for pursuing dogmatic theology is because, well, it's theologically reflecting upon and organizing what has been revealed. And what has been revealed is the teaching and the uh, directions of our salvation, both in terms of achieving our own theosis or beatitude, but also more importantly, bringing the greatest glory to God and pleasing him most perfectly. So um, there is a motivation that's justifiable in pursuing dogmatic theology, even if no exact set of criteria or methodology has been formulated that will satisfy everyone. And I think the, uh, the major aspect of why this is something impossible is simply because the subject of our dogmatic theology ultimately is God himself. Theology proper is the Trinity, and um, in its <clears throat> correlative um, reality or its integral whole, it has to do with the economy of salvation as well. But if the economy of salvation is rooted in the revelation of mysteries, revealed mysteries of faith that can't be demonstrated in terms of natural reason or independently of that divinely authoritative revelation on the one hand, and if our ultimate subject of inquiry is God himself, well, God is, God is infinite and clearly no finite set of criteria or no finite method or number of methods will uh, fully satisfy the various themes um, and aspects of our subject of inquiry. So 
Um, in one sense, then, this should induce humility and gratitude that there is a dogmatic revelation in the first place, um, but also uh, a humility and gratitude that it's not incumbent upon any theologian, uh, school of theologians, or theology as such to finally uh, come up with a unified field theory. Um, rather, uh, we have different aspects and viewpoints and approaches to dogmatic theology wherein we try to best deal with the actual teachings as well as the sources that are witness to those teachings without presuming that um, we can exhaust or in a sense uh, draw a circle around uh, the content of Revelation. Uh, the Again, going back to that fundamental assumption, we already exist, like, like, like Paul says, we exist, move, and have our being in God, and insofar as we're members, believing members of the church, uh, this is our field of reality that we're describing, and because we're already implicated and embedded, so to speak, in this field of reality, this field of, of supernatural revelation, supernatural activity, um, we can have confidence that what we say will have meaning and import without um, putting so much import to the limited content that we may be able to collate and systematize and articulate. <clears throat> and so uh, next then, if, if we have no overarching or universal methods or criteria that everyone is going to agree upon, um, we have to be a little bit more circumspect, perhaps a little more humble and limited in what we set our sights on. And we must then determine to do our best with limited resources in order to formulate and apply a coherent method or even set of methods when doing theology. And because of these limitations, epistemically, historically, and in terms of consensus with respect to dogmatic theology as such, as distinct from dogma, um, we must recognize that any theology that we might articulate and present is in a sense our theology. It's a theology limited by our own limitations, our own context and set of circumstances, and must ultimately remain provisional. Provisional not in the sense that it's filled with falsehoods or that it will be contradicted insofar as it simply repeats and organizes what's already been established and received by consensus and authority as dogma, but rather in terms of certain ramifications, impl implications of that dogma in terms of our own development and advancement of our understanding of dogma, and <clears throat> as well as um, the recognition that the, uh, the stamp of approval, as we will see, comes from the recognition of the church through various criteria of, of any theology. So theologies will be limited, but there is a, a unified uh, a subject of reality, naming do, namely dogma as such, which pertains to uh, the revelation of Christ and ultimately the, the, the Father and the Trinity um, on the one hand, but that our theology also is going to not be able to um, exhaust the content of dogma, but rather will interface with other theological methods and systems equally dogmatic, um, not in terms of a kind of exclusionary or contradictory approach, but rather as a, if the theology is valid and its method is valid, uh, a complementary relationship to other theologies. So our point then is to recognize our own limitations, try to be clear and as exhaustive and comprehensive as possible, but recognize at the same time that we can't be fully exhaustive because of our limitations and because of the very subject matter itself. So what then are some criteria for our theology? Um, our theology ultimately is dependent upon the, the, the church fathers. Um, um, the church fathers as giving witness to and articulating the uh, authoritative teaching of the church itself. So, so the question is then who is a church father. <clears throat> and here we can find common ground that will allow us to move forward. Um, it's recognized 
at least by Eastern Christians and Roman Catholics, that a father is someone who is a canonized saint within an Orthodox liturgical tradition. Um, a father is someone who's a canonized saint whose teaching and doctrine are recognized and named with a certain reverence in um, that Orthodox tradition's liturgical um, offices or um, uh, the uh, synaxaria of the churches. So there's a certain kind of official public recognition of who a church father is and thus where we look to find the um, <clears throat> content or subject matter of our theology. And oftentimes these same fathers are influential and canonized in terms of ecumenical councils recognized in papal magisterial documents and the like, so giving further approbation. Um, moreover then, how do we further identify a church father? That question is, is, is answered in common by Eastern Christians, Roman Catholics, and um, many other Christians that a father consists in um, a holy or saintly theologian that is recognized, as I just mentioned, in uh, an ecumenical council. And we will find in terms of uh, Ephesus 431, uh, Chalcedon 451, Chalcedon 553, um, Constantinople uh, 681 and, and the like, Nicaea 2, um, that uh, certain individuals, certain holy fathers of the church are named by name as authorities within those councils and thereby um, approbation is given to their teaching and thus they are safe or even better approved or recommended sources for us as we seek to discover the contents of theology as well as the methods of our dogmatic theology. And then finally, a third point, um, all Catholics, um, Latin and Eastern, um, additionally recognize a church father that is designated in um, decrees flowing from the Roman Magisterium. This is because the Pope of Rome, because of his office, uh, merits a certain respect and obedience with respect to all uh, matters pertaining to or uh, in harmony with the universal Catholic traditions of the one holy Catholic Church. And that these uh, declarations of the Roman Pontiff um, are in no way out of harmony or disconsonant with the legitimate rights and privileges of the Sui Juris churches of the East. <clears throat> And then uh, a further note then, if there is a uh, added solemnity or clarification or even inclusion of certain figures as church fathers on the basis of the authority of the Roman magisterium, there also then is this important aspect of not a father of the church, but a doctor. Now, clearly um, some fathers of the church are doctors of the church, but not all doctors of the church in this sense, in terms of the declaration of the Roman magisterium on the authority of the Pope are fathers of the church. Um, and so a father of the church will have a more basic primordial pertinence and practical authority for our pursuit of theology. However, uh, doctors of the church, the great medieval doctors of the church, um, such as uh, St. Anselm, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, and one might even include, include by implication a figure like Duns Scotus, they will also have uh, a great deal of authority for Catholic theologians, whether Eastern or Roman, because of this recognition of their teachings, these the, the doctor's teachings, that is, uh, consonance and harmony with the uh, common witness of the, um, the more properly understood and termed church fathers. So now that we've cleared the ground a little bit in terms of uh, what dogma is and how things are approached um, in terms of a dogmatic the uh, theological project, uh, we'll give a, a few comments on some sound guides in terms of approaching dogmatic theology, especially with respect to adjudicating the nature and authority of a teaching as dogmatic or 
perhaps just the oligomena, um, things, things of that nature, as well as how we interact with philosophical traditions and concepts, how those philosophical traditions and concepts were received and employed by the church fathers. Um, and then also what just are, or what, what's, what are the best ways of categorizing just where we look for sources of dogmatic theology. And then finally, um, how do we conceive of developments? How do we recognize, why should there be developments? And then how do we recognize those developments? And the four figures on this, in this slide, Vincent of Lorraine, um, John of Damascus, Melchior Cano, and uh, John Henry Newman are key figures, though not exclusive or exhaustive, but key figures and safe and sound figures for approaching these various questions. And you will see that in a sense, <clears throat> there are implications of adjudicating what have been called theological notes or, or levels of authority of, of dogmatic teaching or non-dogmatic teaching through and in, in inclusive of the use of philosophical terminology, concepts, and categories, as well as doctrinal development. So the, the question of at least implicitly doctrinal development, the integration of reason and faith, and the use and appropriation of, of philosophical categories in theological discourse are presented and articulated in clear and um, universal ways sufficient to serve as guides for those engaging in the further project of entering into a direct encounter with and um, participation in this broader project of um, focusing on post-Chalcedonian Christology proper. These four figures serve as excellent guides. So let's begin with uh, St. Vincent. St. Vincent of, of Lorraine was a, a, a Gallic uh, monk um, who uh, died in 445, so sometime around that. He was a, a very important op uh, opponent of Nestorius, a defender of the title of Theotokos, but perhaps he is best known for his famous uh, commonatorium or a commonatory uh, of 434, which provides within itself uh, uh, what became a universally accepted uh, threefold criteria for adjudicating what is authentic teaching versus what is inauthentic teaching in terms of disputed questions, especially the rise of heresy. And we'll find embedded or implied within this threefold criterion that um, St. Vincent provides in the commonatory that there is implicit the, the recognition of a certain kind of development and how those developments need to be adjudicated. So in uh, the second chapter in the sixth paragraph of his commonatorium, St. Vincent provides what essentially amounts to a threefold fold criterion for judging the authenticity and truthfulness of any kind of uh, theological pronouncement. So it gives us the, it gives a, a set of criteria for adjudicating true and false teaching, true and false dogma, real dogma versus spurious dogma, and then how these can be applied and integrated in any kind of theological reflection and exposition. And I'll, I'll just read what St. Vincent has here in, his, in terms of his rule or canon. Uh, St. Vincent says, moreover, in the Catholic Church itself, all possible care must be taken that we hold the faith or that faith which has been believed everywhere, always and by all. So we have that, that threefold criteria of universality, antiquity, and consent. Um, going on with St. Vincent, for that is truly, and in the strictest sense, Catholic, which, as the name itself and the reason of the thing declare, comprehends all universally. This rule we shall observe if we follow universality, antiquity, and consent. And there is the uh, threefold criteria explicitly. And he goes on to explain, we shall follow universality if we confess that one true faith to be true, which the whole church throughout the world confesses. Antiquity, if we in no wise depart from those interpretations, which it is manifest were notoriously held, notoriously held, meaning sufficiently clear and public um, by our holy ancestors and fathers in consent in like manner, if in antiquity itself we adhere to the consist, uh, consensiate definitions and determinations of all, or at least of almost all priests and doctors. So what he's uh, purporting here 
is not a, an impossible caricature of absolute universality and absolute uh, transparency and access to every bit of information such that we can uh, you know, infer the truth of a given proposition as though it were the, the uh, result of an equation such as 2 plus 2 equals 4. No, there's, there's not access to that kind of certainty. Rather, he says, that there's a kind of moral um, certainty and moral unanimity that, unanimity that can be ascertained on the basis of universality, what the common confession of the faith is. And this common confession will be antique. It will be something common to the church throughout time, not just space, and also then in terms of not an absolute uh, comprehensive knowledge of everything that was ever said by uh, a church father, but rather that um, there's at least a, an overwhelming or sufficient um, priority to a certain teaching that was affirmed by the majority um, or St. Vincent says himself, almost all priests and doctors and fathers of the church. So if he establishes the criteria of adjudicating true dogmatic teachings from spurious dogmatic teachings in his uh, Commonatorium uh, chapter 29, number 77, we read St. Vincent saying, quote, uh, we said likewise that in the church itself, Regard must be has, had to the consensiat voice of universality equally with that of antiquity. We just went over that in the previous slide. Um, going on, lest we either be torn from the integrity of unity and carried away to schism. So there's a clear aspect of heresy leading to schism uh, and, and the, the, the implication, although they're distinct acts, they're, they're there, there's a certain kind of inevitability or inevitability of correlation between heresy leading to schism. Um, so what uh, St. Vincent, Vincent is speaking of is he's trying to block this tendency towards schism through the appeal of universality and antiquity. Going on with St. Vincent now, lest we be, uh, nope, excuse me, or be precipitated from the religion of antiquity into heretical novelties. So here he brings up the issue of true dogma versus spurious dogma, and then the question of novelty. Going on, uh, St. Vincent writes, we said further that in this same ecclesiastical antiquity, two points are very clearly and earnestly to be held in view by those who would keep clear of heresy. First, they should ascertain whether any decision has been given in ancient times as to the matter in question by the whole priesthood of the Catholic Church with the authority of a general council. So what he's appealing to is antiquity and universality in terms of uh, the authority of a general council. So the first thing is that Vincent wants to address is whether or not the question has been authoritatively and definitively declared upon by the church as a whole in general council. Going on with St. Vincent. And secondly, if some new question, so here comes the issue of development, if some new questions should arise on which such no such decision has been given, they should then have recourse to the opinions of the Holy Fathers. So this, the second point methodologically is if there hasn't been a definitive decision, we look to the, the, the church fathers in order to see what they've said about it. And so this is a safe um, method to find safe and authoritative sources. So if we can't find a definitive teaching, we look to the opinions of the Holy Fathers. Going on then um, with St. Vincent, of at least those who, each in his own time and place, remained in the unity of communion and of the faith were, and were accepted as approved masters. So the acceptance of, deprove, of approved masters feeds back into that statement I made earlier about the recognition of the church, especially through councils and um, magisterial pronouncements. So this methodology is something that Vincent posits back in the fifth century, which nevertheless is we find we find manifest throughout the history of the church and its subsequent conciliar and magisterial tradition and still holds today. The methodology is look first to the authoritative teaching of the church. Secondly, find the church fathers and find those church fathers and their opinions, consult their opinions that were accepted as approved teachers. Uh, for the church and the faithful.
going on with St. Vincent. And whatsoever these may be found to have held with one mind and, and in one consent. So now we're moving to the question of a kind of moral unanimity. Um, not necessarily explicit authoritative um, dogmatic um, pronouncements, but rather a certain kind of moral unanimity that um, because of the common life of the church and the common dogmatic foundation of the church, a common consent, even in terms of a moral consensus, um, is sufficiently indicative of what the truth of the question or the dogmatic truth of the question in terms of its essence or formal definition or in terms of its ramifications will imply. And so if you find um, consent going on with uh, St. Vincent again, with one mind and one consent, uh, such ought to be accounted the true and Catholic doctrine of the church without any doubt or scruple. So even though there are epistemic and historical limitations in terms of dealing with the content, the material content of revelation, of dogma, and thus how this would apply to dogmatic theology, there is a, uh, the appeal to epistemically and morally the moral consensus or the common consent of the church fathers, even in lieu of um, authoritative church pronouncements. Um, just never let it be said as a parenthetical here, that in the absence of true pronouncements, we might find an anticipation of a, a later need to clarify authoritatively through counsel or such other uh, definitive ecclesiastical um, declaration. So, so you know, moral consents, consensus in the past does not preclude um, dogmatic definitional clarity in the future. Uh, Vincent is simply saying that if there isn't yet a dogmatic definition. The consensus of the fathers is safe to believe and perhaps even ought to be believed as the true teaching of the church in lieu of and or until the church herself clarifies the question definitively. Having brought the issue, at least the uh, of an early or inchoate notion of, of development in Vincent himself, um, <clears throat> this is further clarified or manifested in his own analogies for development. And you can look at the combinatory uh, chapter 23 numbers 40, 54 through 59 on some of these analogies, but they can be basically limited to two, the, the child adult analogy and the seed plant analogy. And these are these become commonplace uh, or common metaphors or analogies for development throughout church history. And we find them uh, making their way and employed to a great extent in the post, uh, arguably so, post-scholastic period um, following the Second Vatican Council, and as well as the uh, writings of John Henry Newman, uh, whom we will discuss a bit later. So primary analogies uh, that you find in Vincent for development in the the teaching of the church are the child to the adult and the seed to the plant. And these are useful analogies that get at the question of how does one revelation, um, one faith delivered once for all, uh, undergo change and interact with the realities of uh, historical limitations, historical contingencies and developments. So if we have positive analogies supplied by St. Vincent all the way back in the fifth century, he also then uh, revisiting his threefold criteria or his threefold canon presents certain limits. Um, the limits are universality, antiquity, and consent. Uh, if a teaching cannot be situated or organized rationally in terms of one of these two analogies for development, um, while still preserving universality, antiquity, and consent in terms of the um, core teaching or the essential teaching and its development and application, then it would run afoul of Vincent's rule for development. So uh, early on in the uh, life of the church, there was a perceived need to articulate how um, dogmatic teaching and dogma can itself change but how that change doesn't it, it, it entail an essential addition 
or a uh, departure from that uh, one faith first delivered by Christ um, to his apostles at the uh, at the outset or the the inception of the infant church. Moving on to John of Damascus. John of Damascus, we find not so much a theoretician of development, although he implicitly um, he implicitly uses concepts and categories that are, are taken up into development. Um, rather, the importance of John of Damascus is that he is a theologian who recognizes the development, and in a certain sense, in his own project <clears throat> in the Fount of Knowledge accomplishes a further development in dogmatic theology insofar as he presents a synthesis of the Byzantine Orthodox faith with respect to the broad outline of theology, namely Trinity, creation, incarnation, last things, which is inclusive of the other subcategories of theology having to do with sacraments, um, Mariology um, and the like, ecclesiology and the like. Um, he, St. John of Damascus presents both uh, a, a theologian who accomplishes and carries out dogmatic theology in this developmental synthetic mode, while at the same time is able to explain how um, the sources, both profane and revealed and uh, patristic, should be integrated and employed in an exposition of dogmatic faith. So he begins with some, some basic notions in his early, uh, the first work of what became to be known as the Fount of Knowledge, namely the philosophical chapters. And he lays out some prerequisites for the theologians. So to be understood, St. John of Damascus is pursuing a project of the dogmatic theologian um, of what St. Anselm would call faith-seeking understanding rather than uh, doing positive theology. Nevertheless, he engages in positive theology because the there is a certain interplay and dependency of dogmatic theology for its contents upon positive theology. So it's not as though he's excluding positive theology and engaging in um, isolated abstraction. No, he's using the sources and in fact saying these sources must be used by the theologian who is going to be a dogmatic theologian, but we must understand how they're ordered, how they're to be used, and how they're to produce clearer understanding and synthesis. So beginning with the, the philosophical chapters, he's, he lays out some prerequisites for the, for the theologian, which interestingly, the book is entitled Philosophical Chapters, but yet he's talking about the theologian. So he's saying the theologian is using philosophy and philosophical categories in order to pursue theology. So he'll have to explain that uh, a bit further, how that, how that should work out, and we will get to that. So he, but first, the prerequisites. First, the, the theologian must have humility. He must recognize or she must recognize the his own or her own ignorance and therefore must labor to come to knowledge. Now, this knowledge is of the contents of the sources of theology and philosophy. So he must recognize that he doesn't know everything and he must work to learn. And rooted in all this is throughout this entire process, the theologian who is going to be a good dogmatic theologian must have undergone and be continually undergoing a certain purification of heart. This will, in, a, in the words of uh, St. Bonaventure, this will polish the mirror. St. Paul says, we see through a glass darkly or through a mirror darkly. This will polish the mirror, allowing for those um, truths or manifestations of <clears throat> the divine energies to be better perceived and then therefore better articulated through this purification of heart. In terms of method, so so much for the prerequisites, in terms of method, uh, St. John of Damascus, and we'll get to this uh, more in the next lecture because this will be absolutely essential as a propedeutic for doing dogmatic theology, um, it, namely the, the use of the Greeks or philosophy. And so the method that St. John of Damascus um, advocates and employs is the appropriation of the philosophy of the Greeks, the great Greek philosophers, especially in terms of metaphysical um, and anthropological categories, as well as the organization of various philosophical distinctions and um, philosophical 
subjects of inquiry as well as methods of uh, debate and demonstration, methods of articulation, communication. So his method is to use and appropriate those truths of the Greeks that are true in themselves and also incorporated into the theology and language of the church fathers, especially the Cappadocians, but also the Alexandrians to, to, a, to a great extent, in the employment of a fuller and clearer articulation of the key points of dogmatic theology. St. John of Damascus believes that these philosophical categories are essential and helpful, both in themselves and because they were used by the church fathers for a sound understanding of what we mean by the Trinity, what we mean by the incarnation in terms of person, nature, essence, hypostasis, energies, all of these categories, he says, we must use and employ the philosophy of the Greeks, but the philosophy of the Greeks towards an understanding of the teaching of the one teacher of all, Christ, who is teacher and guide. Um, he says, uh, he uses the analogy of the bee, the bee that gathers a multiplicity of sources in order to produce um, sweet tasting honey. So uh, the theologian, so argues St. John of Damascus, must gather these various sources, both from the Greeks as well as from the patristic witness, and especially the conciliar and scriptural uh, teachings. And finally then, as he's doing this gathering, collating, organiz or, or organizational and um, synthetic project, he determines, and again, this is uh, echoing, that you'll find this, we'll find this echoed throughout the conciliar tradition, as well as the patristic tradition in our period of, uh, of inquiry, that his goal is to add nothing and to merely gather together and organize. So novelty is anathema to the church fathers, and therefore development cannot be, in the mind of the church fathers, something that creates a true novelty. St. John also notes that knowledge is the light of the soul and the teacher and guide is Christ. So again, echoing or supporting my earlier contention that St. John of Damascus, even in his philosophical chapters, is operating as a theologian and using theology within the, using philosophy within the context or for the further purpose of articulating a dogmatic theology. This is, this is, tr this is supported by his statement that knowledge is the light of the soul, but the teacher and guide of that soul is Christ, and that the love of God going on is true philosophy. So, so Damascene is, is, is indicating how he thinks the order between theos theology, philosophy and theology should be conceived and how they should interact and interface. Um, clearly, philosophy has its own domain and true truths of reality were discovered and articulated by pagan philosophers. But ultimately, the purpose of all knowledge is to enlighten the soul and to dispose it for the further teaching of Jesus Christ and to take Jesus Christ himself as guide in order to love God. This is the fullest and truest philosophy in its most proper sense. <clears throat> and then finally, he provides some methods, and we will go into that uh, in the next lecture. But especially pertinent will be uh, how he uses uh, Greek notions of, of argumentation and demonstration, basically four methods, and how he incorporates Greek philosophical categories, which were also employed by um, the Byzantine church fathers, especially the Cappadocians, in order to clarify or articulate and even correct or perhaps transfigure these Greek philosophical categories so that they can be fit instruments for um, an articulation of dogmatic theology. So it wasn't an instance of, of uh, David using the armor of Saul to King Saul to fight Goliath. Uh, he hadn't proved them. They, they weren't fitting. They, were, they, they didn't work for him. In certain cases, um, St. John of Damascus will, in a sense, through the witness and use of the church fathers of philosophical, Greek philosophical categories, make alterations or make applications or extensions of Greek philosophical thought and concepts in order to fit and articulate the prior and more essential 
the dogma of the church as revealed and believed by faith. So the Damascene then has important things to say about the sources. Where do we get the sources? The use of the sources, both in terms of uh, Greek philosophy, but also in term, terms of ecclesiastical and patristic authorities. He articulates, and especially in the De Fide Orthodoxa, or on the Orthodox faith, he demonstrates how these sources are used and integrated to formulate um, a coherent summary and presentation of dogmatic theology. And this will then bear upon the context in which these sources are used, and more importantly, out of which or in which the sources themselves were first articulated. And then finally, the manifestation, or excuse me, the end of the use of these sources, the end of dogmatic theology is like philosophy. The only true philosophy is the love of God. And our one teacher is Christ, the one who comes from heaven and declares the Father in the words of uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 18. So the Damascene is a key source, and he will remain a central figure, even though we will move through a historical exposition of the, of the developments in Christology post-Chalcedon. The Damascene will remain a privileged point of integration and point of departure and clarification for this entire study, because he is, he is um, such a, an exemplary figure of dogmatic methodology as well as synthesis and output. <clears throat> the next figure following uh, St. John of Damascus is the, uh, the Spanish theologian Melchior Cano, who died around, uh, 50, well, died in 1560, who wrote the famous De Logis Theologicis, uh, a posthumous work published two years after his death. And the important things here, thing here is that unlike um, Vincent of Lorraine, and unlike St. John of Damascus, who speak of sources and use sources, Kano's uh, work actually articulates and distinguishes the sources. And so it, he, he provides us with a helpful and useful and safe list of what these sources are in their distinction and in their order of importance. <clears throat> so there are 10 locuses of theology or sources of theology uh, as articulated by Kano. Um, a later theologian, a 20th century Benedictine theologian, who uh, who was uh, who helped author the uh, the Second Vatican Council's um, Constitution on the Liturgy, um, Sacrosanctum Concilium, uh, a Benedictine liturgist theologian named um, Cipriano Vagagini, uh, Benedictine, he added to these ten sources also liturgy as a valid source of theology, which is absolutely correct, especially from an Eastern standpoint, but from any, uh, any, any, uh, but from the standpoint of any uh, Orthodox Catholic tradition, this must be the case. So liturgy is collated after scriptures taken in themselves as a source of theology, absent in Kano. Likely, uh, as with ecclesiology, many of the scholastics didn't have a specific treatise on ecclesiology because it was assumed. It was kind of the air they breathed so they didn't see it. Liturgy also, um, it was so omnipresent and ever-present in their thinking and in their lives that it was taken for granted, but Vagagini rightly distinguished that in addition to scripture and um, magisterial teachings, uh, liturgy itself is a source of theology. <clears throat> um, so liturgy may be collated after the first, the, the number one criteria, the scripture is taken in themselves, and two, tradition as taken in itself. That's the second point. The third point is liturgy serves a transitional role, both as a monument, namely a written formula, and what we're talking about in terms of sources of theology are monuments of theology primarily because they're written formulae that are witnesses or records of what is the content of dogmatic theology and its developments both formally and explicitly, but as well as uh, in terms of exposition and commentary throughout the tradition. Um, <clears throat> on the one hand, and on the, 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 on the, on the in a transitional role between monument as both a monument and as um, 
an aspect of the living magisterium, the liturgical preacher and commentary, uh, commentator. So the liturgy has this um, liminal role where it interfaces um, between written monument, because clearly there are liturgies that are contained and codified in liturgical books, as well as the lived expression through preaching and commentating by the magisterium. So liturgy is, a, is an interesting um, kind of interface or pivotal um, locus of theology, and perhaps in that sense, more difficult to analyze in terms of a strict source of theology, but nevertheless, it should be taken as a source of theology. And Melchior Cano is one of the first, if not the first, to articulate in the spirit of, for example, St. Vincent of Lorraine or, or um, St. John of Damascus, these different sources, he's the first one to explicitly articulate and distinguish what these sources are and how many sources there are. <clears throat> so he divided, um, Cano divided uh, the sources of theology into proper and improper. Um, and the proper sources of theology are, in the first place, scripture, uh, tradition and liturgy, and under that tradition and liturgy, you have the magisterium, which is the teaching authority of the church. And in modern times, this has been subdivided into extraordinary magisterium, um, which is a conciliar or um, de fide pronouncement of a pope, the ordinary magisterium, which is the common teaching of the all the bishops in union with the pope, and the ordinary and universal magisterium, which is the common the common teaching of the pope that achieves and achieves a, a unanimity and solidity, even though not declared or defined explicitly, but yet a unanimity and uh, solemnity that renders this belief or this dogmatic teaching worthy of belief, even if not defined. And this this would, they don't exactly match up these criteria. They don't perfectly match up with Vincent's threefold criteria and his appeal to church authority on the one hand or the consensus of the fathers, but you can certainly recognize the development of this. So the consensus of the fathers would be analogous to the ordinary and universal magisterium, whereas the extraordinary magisterium would be a strictly analogous and a development of and an, and an application of um, conciliar authority, while the ordinary magisterium rather is something undeclared and not something that is able to be ascertained as universal, but nevertheless authoritative and thus practically binding uh, upon the faithful in terms of belief and or practice. And think back to what I said earlier in, a, in an earlier slide about the two uh, functions of magisterium. Those things having to do with worship, with piety, with everyday belief that are to be given reverence, and those uh, functions of the magisterium that are to, are to be believed in divine authority. Well, the ordinary magisterium is like liturgy is to um, monuments and to living magisterium. Ordinary magisterium is to those things given reverence as well as those things um, that are binding. It, it, it's, a, it's a kind of transitional um, mode of the, the operation of the magisterium um, that is analogous to um, liturgy in terms of monuments, its relation to monument and living magisterium. And then uh, after or underneath, and but yet inclusive or included within tradition and liturgy are the texts of tradition. And primarily for, for our purposes, the church fathers receive a privilege of place, but um, Kano will also include uh, with a, a lesser priority, but nevertheless a solemnity, doctors of the church, as well as approved theologians. And then finally, the common consent of the faithful. This belief is received uh, and understood and lived out as something revealed by Christ and binding upon believers in terms of divine faith. So that, that's finally the, the actual belief of the faithful through time is becomes then a witness to um, to the dogmatic or for the dogmatic theologian of the contents of theology proper in terms of pursuing dogmatic theology in an a posteriori method. So those are the, the, the sources of theology proper, which again, you can see each one of these either stem from revelation um, or um, 
our revelation directly, like the words of scripture, the inspired words of scripture, um, or um, are directly commentating on the words of scripture. I mean, excuse me, not the words of scripture, but revelation proper. <clears throat> In the next, this slide, we see that there are a number of improper uh, sources of theology as well. And these are those used by, or, or um, used by theologian as theologians, dogmatic theologians as adjuncts uh, of reason or adjuncts of theology provided by natural reason. And these are philosophy, history, law, etc. Philosophical categories, which we've already philosophical truths or truths and data points um, accessible by natural reason, which we've already seen St. John of Damascus employing in his fount of knowledge, the wisdom of the Greeks, for example, used as witnesses or aids to understanding what are the th sources of theology proper. And these categories, in a sense, represent a very helpful and comprehensive breakdown of the various sources of theology to which dogmatic theologians must have recourse in order to adequately pursue uh, a coherent and methodologically sound um, dogmatic theological approach or project. Just a word on liturgy and dogmatic theology. Um, liturgy is, is, is essential because, and it, it, again, it has this unique position because liturgy uh, enacts the unfolding and real presence of Christ the high priest. So not only is it a sign, not only is it a declaration or a teaching, it also is the enacting and rendering present the realization of the very source and summit of our faith, especially in the economy, because the source of the church is the Eucharist and the liturgy is the locus and means by which the Eucharist is realized and made present. So we can say then, um, the liturgy can never be categorized as a mere monument. Rather, it it can be understood as a, a, a theologia, theolo, theologia prima, a primary theology, because it's dealing, it is the place where in dogmatic theologians and all the faithful, for that example, for that, um, for that matter, um, interact directly and most intimately with the very reality of our Savior, with the very reality of the source of the economy of salvation. It thus, it's primary theology. It's not secondary theology because it's theology itself, meaning God becoming present to us sacramentally and through the energies of the graces of the Holy Spirit. So thus we can say liturgy is not a standard locus theologicus or, or, or topos because it's not a mere monument. It's theologia or theologia prima because it differs from theologia secunda, out of which dogma and orthodoxy arise. Meaning the dogmatic theologian normally reflects upon what has been written and preserved in monuments and thus writes in a derivative manner. These monuments are derivative of this first theological reality of Christ himself in the Eucharist, which obviously presupposes a historical incarnation and an eternal trinity. And so that's that's an important point. That's why um, liturgy has this kind of mediatory or transitional character between uh, monument and living tradition. So um, finally, in what manner can we, uh, or additionally, in what manner can we distinguish between Theologia Prima and Theologia Secunda? Um, in what way is there um, a certain loss for words when faced with the uh, real sacramental mystery of, of the liturgy there's, there's, or the Eucharistic celebration within the liturgy? Uh, a legitimate question, um, but I think it's important methodologically without speaking too much more about the difficulties in terms of uh, articulating the difference between Theologia Prima and Theologia Secunda on the one hand, and uh, speaking to the fullness of what's contained in the liturgy in terms of its substantial ontological reality of Christ himself. Um, 
it's just, it's important nevertheless to preserve liturgy as a privileged locus of theological reflection a, a true theological source that theologians must have recourse to when articulating and reflecting upon uh, theology in a dogmatic mode. The last person to be considered is John Henry Newman and his notes of development. Now, um, <clears throat> without trying to draw the connections uh, bet between Newman and his forebears, I think we can take it as, a, as granted that there's a continuity and Newman is in the 19th century further articulating on the basis of uh, 1500 years of development um, and history what um, St. Vincent of Loren was, was putting down. And because of this development, because of further questions and additional difficulties arising that uh, St. Vincent wouldn't have foreseen, um, the explanation is going to be more elaborate, more developed, um, and going to going to need to take something like 400 pages rather than you know the 100 pages that St. Vincent takes in um, his uh, commonatorium. So Newman writes his famous essay on the development of Christian doctrine, and what he's trying to justify is the the reality that Christianity has remained identical from its beginning, nevertheless in the face of rapidly changing and increasing statements that are purported to be and accepted to be dogmatic that go well beyond initial and early statements. And also he's dealing with the deviations throughout history, um, especially the, the schismatic developments that occurred subsequent to um, St. Vincent of, of Lorraine writing his commonatorium. And so it, basically in his essay on the development of Christian doctrine, he's not really so, so much providing a theory, but he's providing <clears throat> an articulation of how development might work out historically, how it seems to have worked out historically, assuming again, the truth of dogma, the consistency of dogma and a certain development of dogma, maintaining and according to a continuity and a theological hermeneutic that, that appreciates this continuity. Um, so there already are built in certain dogmatic commitments about the fact that Christianity didn't fail and that Christianity hasn't contradicted itself. So how do you explain this? Well, in the first place in his essay, and you can see this right in his table of contents for the essay, is that there are three basic characteristics of doctrinal development. The first one is a certain development of ideas. And for ideas, I take Newman to be meaning something akin to the medieval notion of ratio or, or the older patristic notion of a principle. A principle is something that is the basis of some sort of energetic process, which can include development. And a principle must remain integral and um, maintain a certain in integral unity for it to actually be a principle. So if an idea develops, it has to be the same idea, not a different idea. So that's the first thing. Um, because of the nature of ideas and any articulation of an idea will imply both lateral and linear um, implication and interrelations with other concepts, you would expect, or Newman argues, there are antecedent grounds for expecting developments. Ideas will have ramifications for other topics. An idea, if you state an idea, there will be a further implication that will then need to be stated on the basis of that idea that still preserves and brings forward, or in, a, in an Irenaean, Bonaventurian sense, recapitulate the initial idea. And then finally, he says, history is an aid and locus for discovering developments. The only place that we have to look primarily for real developments in the life of the church is not in a philosophical or speculative mode, even though we must use philosophy and speculate, speculation to, to articulate and to identify both the discontinuities and the continuities in any question of the development of an idea, especially doctrinal developments, Nevertheless, speculation is not the primary, is not the starting point 
for discerning developments of, of, of doctrine or the developments of idea. History, he says, is the primary aid and locus for discovering development. And then he goes on then, so, so much for doctrinal developments, the development of ideas, ideas ramify, they have, they take on a life of their own. Um, there are antecedent grounds for develop, for developments. And finally, history is the place to look for developments. We've got to look in the sources of theology, which includes the writings of the fathers, the magisterial teaching of the church, scripture, etc., in order to see where these developments occurred. And oftentimes we'll discover that developments occur, positive developments occur, in the context of someone positing as a development of a, of a dogma something that is spurious or contradicts the dogma. And it takes uh, further, uh, a further individual to recognize that this is a contradiction, explain why it's a contradiction, and counter posit a true implication of this development by either restating the original idea as such or restating the original idea that encompasses the genuine insight of the spurious assertion while preserving the fundamental integrity of the original idea. So then, so, so much for doctrinal developments, Newman then provides seven notes of genuine developments. And what Newman is doing here is he's not trying to provide an exhaustive list. He's rather saying these are some helpful rules of thumb that um, help us to identify, or at least have been used to identify, and can be used even now to identify true developments from spurious developments. And the first is a preservation of type. And this preservation of type is what motivates me to say ideas are not, um, you know, something to be understood in a hum Humean or Lockean sense as a pure being of reason, but rather something that is an objective principle in the world um, or ratio in the world that has a certain integrity that the mind participates in. Uh, Newman, in my opinion, is not a, not a nominalist, but something more along the lines of a moderate realist. What the ideas in our mind truly represent and correspond to realities that are objective in themselves. So when he says the first note of a genuine development is preservation of type, I think he just means that. There is a certain truth that's presented and articulated that develops in continuity, not in contradiction. And this flows into the second, the continuity of the second note of genuine developments, the continuity in its principles. A doctrine of development will maintain continuity. We think of um, Benedict XVI in his 2005 Christmas address, a hermeneutic of continuity. Another note of genuine development, the third note, is the power of assimilation. A true doctrine and a true development will be able to assimilate new information and new implications into that original type according to its intrinsic principles. And because there is a preservation of type and a continuity in principles, then this assimilation will imply a fourth note, a logical sequence. A logical sequence that doesn't merely represent a point of arrival for the discussion up to that point, but also a new point of departure, namely in anticipation of its future, the fifth note. And because of all of these first five uh, notes that indicate or help indicate a genuine development, we'll find that there is not just an anticipation of its future in terms of the idea and applied to dogmatic theology, doctrine of development, there will be a conservative action on its past. This is that notion of recapitulation. A doctrinal development will conserve the reality and the truth embedded in a Con continuous, not discontinuous manner that brings forward what was in the past and, 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 and recapitulates it or reset, uh, resets the teaching in a new context with greater clarity. And then because of all of these seven notes, there will be a certain kind of chronic vigor. And this is what Newman is saying here is essentially what uh, St. Vincent is saying. This is something believed everywhere, um, always, and by all. There's a certain vigor or, or strength through time and space of this idea. And so these seven notes of development are very helpful. And we, if we keep them in mind, as we look at um, the, uh, the development of Christology post-Chalcedon, then we'll see that Newman is being an accurate, um, in a sense, a phenomenological um, representative 
of what actually de facto did take place and allows us to, or provides us rather with the rules of thumb that explains how and why this took, took place, but always again, presupposing the integrity and truth of revelation itself and the, the, the central and sound motivation of dogmatic faith on the part of the believer in undertaking dogmatic theology with respect to both its a priori assumptions as well as its a posteriori methodology and goals. So to sum up then, <clears throat> we can say that the church and the living tradition are in a kind of synergy. Uh, the living magisterium, the hierarch, ultimately the bishops in union with the pope and the pope himself, um, or to a lesser extent, the priest or the deacon, they express the living magisterium within the liturgy. And this, this ramifies into mystagogy and entering into uh, the mysteries itself and um, finds application in the spiritual life in terms of spiritual theology. And so the living magisterium is inspired or fortified by a liturgical prayer and the activity of the Holy Spirit in synergy with the liturgist, meaning the dogmatic theologian, in this sense, when we say the axiom is the theologian is he who prays, and hence he who prays is a theologian. So the entire, the, the, and an upshot of all this is that in, insofar as the believer is pursuing dogmatic theology, he's pursuing it within the context of a living church with a living magisterium that is in real time expressed and realized in liturgical worship. Thus, the, lit the dogmatic theology, though its mode is intellectual, nevertheless, it's rooted in and flows out and back into prayer. And prayer ultimately is the expression on the part of the creature of praise, thanksgiving, and love to the Father, his, cre his creator, through the Son, in the Spirit. And thus the truest theologian will be the liturgist because the liturgy, the liturgist is the one who prays and the liturgist is the one who prays in and through and from the living magisterium as manifest in the liturgy itself. So a fortiori then the hierarch is the highest theologian for he expounds and Jesus according to St. Bonaventure and Mary are the co-hierarchs of the church in a hierarchy above all other hierarchies. Thus, Jesus is the one teacher, and anyone who is to be a theologian is to conform himself to the hierarch, the highest theologian who declares the Father, because the hierarch expounds on his experience, Christ, Christ's own experience of the Father in his uh, filial relationship to the Father expounds and gives us this reality in the liturgy, in the mystery of the celebration of the liturgy of the Eucharist, the highest form of prayer. So what then can we end with um, this lecture? We can say our theology is our theology because of limitations, limitations and constraints. We don't have um, access to the mind of God. We don't have access to the mind of the minds of the blessed. So our theology, while speculative in mode, is ultimately practical because it depends upon a positive revelation. It's practical insofar as its final outcome is that we may become good, that we may bring glory and honor to the Father, that we may love the Trinity and our neighbor because of what we know has been revealed in Christ. So ultimately, theology is practical, not pragmatic, but practical insofar as it's so that we may become good, so that we may love as God loved, God loves. So therefore, we can end this lecture with theology. Though possessing systematic and rational and historical content and import, it's ultimately practical. And so dogmatic theology is ultimately to know God better so that we can love God better.